Good evening or good morning. My name is uh, Maya Oswaldich and welcome everyone to another Sliver edition. At least for the next term, we are bringing Sliver again straight into your living room uh, and are happy to have so many viewers with us. This year, Sliver is presenting a mixed tape. So those of you who belong to the generation of cassettes well, we'll remember the habit of creating mixtapes for yourself, for your friends, for the perfect road trip, for the perfect summer, and so on. So the series is uh, a mixtape of our faculty who contributed with their professional interests and pedagogical objectives. We hope you enjoy the selection, and I hand over to Kaiho, uh, who will introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Yeah, thanks, Maya. Um, with great ple pleasure, uh, we are happy to welcome uh, Marika Chowder to our first um, Super Lecture at the Angevante. So uh, <clears throat> Marika is an architectural historian and theorist based in Los Angeles. I think that's where she's uh, zooming from. Uh, Marika started teaching at SARC, I think, since 2017, um, where she heads the History and Theory Department so if you look at the recent uh, events that are happening at SARC or the SARC channel, you see uh, Marika is having a lot of um, conversations and framing a lot of emerging discourses institute-wise by bringing people um, from outside as well as the faculties at the SARC to engage with the broader um, conversation. So in terms of, um, Marika's establishments. She's the she co um, she's a co-editor of the contemporary architectural theory collection called Architecture is All Over, and she also writes for magazines such as Log, AD, AA Files, and Harvard Design Magazine. Uh, Marika holds a PhD from Harvard University, she's and her so work good. has received fundings from the Mellon Center. Graham, um, Graham Foundation, the CCA, as well as other institutes. Um, I think her recent projects include a fresh take on Pranesi, as well as a re-evaluation of the design for Stanford University. So I'm very glad to introduce Marika for tonight's lecture. Thank you, Kaiho. It's really an honor to be here at the Angavante, even if it is just virtual. Um, and thank you also, uh, Maya, for such a delightful warm-up conversation. So it's funny because I'm actually not going to be talking in my role as a historian. So we, you're not going to hear about Paranesi today, and you're not going to hear about Stanford University, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but I actually want to, as you can tell from an incredibly bombastic lecture title, and I'll share my screen in a minute, but I need to kind of preamble this because you don't just walk into um, a design school like the Angavante and title your lecture toward an architecture and expect to get away with it. So I need to kind of <laughs> need to frame um, the, the hubris of the, the title talk just a little bit here. And I wanted to also say that this is going to be strangely American centric today um, because that's just where my head is and that's the discourse that I'm most involved with at the moment. So you're gonna hear a lecture on what we often call the American formal project today um, in its contemporary guises. And many of you will know that term uh, very well. Um, but I will say that it's a totally inadequate term for the general interest in the aesthetic dimension of what we do. Um, first of all, you can have no project that does not involve form. Second of all, America's short, uh, several century long contribution to an ancient discourse hardly uh, uh, gives it the right to put uh, its uh, national uh, um, modifier in front of a, a title like the formal project. So I feel like it is quite possible, uh, especially given the, the, uh, the names associated with the Angavante, uh, that this will have a broader reach than just the United States. Having said that, 
and coming back to toward an architecture. I would say if I had to summarize the time that we're living in, at least in the United States, probably throughout Western Europe as well, it has become increasingly clear that we are living in a time of unprecedented challenges to institutions. Part of this is the welcome and long overdue reckoning with long enfranchised and institutionally entrenched racism, colonialism, misogyny, and socioeconomic discrimination and all forms of oppression. And as I said, that's welcome and necessary and in fact, long overdue. However, in architecture, which is not only a profession, but a discipline, which means that it is part of an institutional body with its own codes and norms, ethics, habits, accepted practices, honed and codified over time, the line between the laudable goal of demolishing bad practices and replacing them with better ones, and the self-immolating goal of tearing down the institution itself is getting a bit blurred. For example, I, I just recently listened to a professor at Princeton argue to a group of undergraduate architecture students that the discipline of architecture itself, because it was founded in its modern form in the West, in Italy, by a bunch of European white men who belong to the upper echelons of society, is an institution that needs to be dismantled. This is a rejection of the disciplinary history um, of architecture. Um, and it's not, a, it's not an unpopular position. I would say that it commonly takes the form of a turn away from disciplinary expertise, which is derided as exclusionary and elitist. And in the US, at least, this stance is very popular amongst those with the least to lose by eschewing such knowledge, those in the academy. I'd say a defining feature of our time to a degree not seen since 1968 and its aftermath is a turn away from, or even an active desire to destroy the discipline from within. As if the proper response upon recognizing deep flaws in a particular field were to leave it and set up camp elsewhere. The issue I see with this is that it entails a faulty assumption that some other territory might prove less polluted or compromised or more worthy as a foundation or in short, any easier to justify. The ground of architecture is the ground of the discipline. The territory of art practices and gallery scaled happenings is no purer. The domain of product design or set design is no less compromised. And for those who prefer to simply stay in the field of architecture, without acknowledging the disciplinary ground on which they build in the mode of the uh, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. Uh, for those, the evidence suggests that indeed those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. I've seen a lot of young, talented designers here on the West Coast, uh, for example, seemingly unselfconsciously repeating the early canon of Frank Gehry, for instance, uh, with blankets stripped over buildings, crumpled paper models, and exposed uh, stick frame construction. These outdated or underdeveloped directions, along with a host of other forms of tinkering around with the minor and the marginal, are presented to the world without the hard work of development, by which I mean projects that are buildable or for which the attempt is being made to build. And because they lack development, this means that they lack the ability to lead to any real expansion or even a change in the contours from say a bad and outdated outline of the discipline to a better one. So the odd thing here, and it's odd, when I say odd, I mean it's odd in the particular way that tragedies are odd or that mysteries are odd, is that architecture of all the elite cultural disciplines, fine art, dance, music, literature, and the like, is actually the least dispensable in moments like the one we're in of civilizational contraction. Buildings are being built technically significant, often aesthetically significant, perhaps negatively so, 
certainly economically significant all around the globe, and they are being built by architects who have largely, largely eschewed the academy, although they feed off its graduates. So what we have is something of a double bind in which often idealistic and talented design faculty feign to move camp while remaining firmly attached to the umbilical cord of institutions on the one hand, producing unserious and sometimes unbuildable designs that seek to affiliate with adjacent but no less problematic fields. And on the other hand, we have a world which continues to build itself in new ways, which is benefiting less and less from the disciplinary innovation traditionally afforded by academies. The hard truth is that disciplinary ground is the only ground we have that allows us in any way to escape the limitations of our present. The central task of architecture, particularly since the failures of the Enlightenment project became clear, is to be other than the environment from which it emerges and not just any old other, but a better other. This seems nearly impossible if you think about it. Um, and I realize that for some of you, I'm rehearsing a quite well-known argument, but I feel that today it needs to be restated. How can architecture as a field be other than the forces that help bring it into being? Well, it can do so by means of its own institutions its own deep wells of untimely and surprising ideas and the forms in which these have manifested in times unlike our own. The discipline of architecture historically considered is not a symptomology of other ills. It is not an index of deeper currents. And if you think about it for a minute, what currents run deeper? It is not an instance of inductively imputed error. The discipline of architecture is a rich cash that is constantly being replenished by scholarly and discursive processes of discovery. It is the only ground we have. There is no less compromised terrain. And not to know it is to limit one's agency and capacity in the world through ignorance. So when I repurpose Le Cubusier's toward an architecture, what I mean is really nothing more profound and certainly nothing more hubristic than the question, what is an architecture we can move toward rather than away from? What are its features? How might it operate counter or in spite of the crushing circumstances of our time? What might we choose to institutionalize rather than demolish now that the territory of the ground of the discipline, which by the way is encroached upon on all sides, is in our hands. So what follows is provisional and it still feels sketchy to me, but I do feel like I'm starting to get my hand around, my hands around some of its general contours. I'll go ahead and do my slideshow. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes. All right. So, first possibility that I see of an architecture we might want to move toward is what I'm calling shape as form. Um, for some of you, that's an obvious reference. Now in architecture, when we think of shape, a lot of us go back to this historical piece by Bob Sommel, which defines shape in opposition to what Greg Lynn was working on at the time, which he was calling form. So if I could just summarize um, a quite complicated and still very interesting debate, Sommel was presenting shape as sort of the easy or cool or illicit um, uh, ver uh, um, a response to uh, uh, Greg Lynn's form, which was hard, um, and uh, which was um, uh, not something that was illicit, but something that was legitimate, uh, and something um, that 
was certainly um, uh, legible. Um, but I think when Somo launched his kind of two page, this is the issue with having a two page manifesto, I guess. Um, uh, it, it maybe was less clear than it could have been the kind of full aesthetic background to what shape actually is. And I wanna go back to Rudolf Arnheim. He's a Gestalt psychologist. Um, and uh, an art uh, theorist who I think is just as relevant today as he was um, it, during the 20th century when he was writing. And this is a quite late piece by him, but it sums up this point fairly well. An essential difference needs to be recognized between form and mere shape. So what Arnheim is saying is that all objects have shape, whether they're mental or physical, natural or constructed, complete or incomplete, accidental or planned. And then he goes on to talk about what separates shape from form is that form is a shape that has been cognized. It's been entered somehow into our linguistic symbolic understanding of the world. Shape is something that is precognition. And therefore shape has this weird property and Arnheim writes about it, I think quite beautifully. What mobilizes, and I'm, I'm quoting a bit from the second paragraph on the screen, what mobilizes the human mind, first of all, are not simply bodies as such, but things that move and change. Things that approach as helpers or enemies. Things that perform. Their actions are more impelling than their thingness. Before you know what hits you, you know that you are being hit. And that moment of what Barthes calls punta, that pop to the gut, is where shape lives. It's shape before it is fully cognized, before you know what hits you, you know you are being hit. So an example that I'd like to use, and this is a quite uh, early project um, uh, here compared to most of what I'll be presenting, is Andrew Zago's Museum of Modern Korean History, um, which was basically a facade project uh, for an existing concrete frame uh, uh, a building in Seoul. 2010, I think. And when you look at this, you're looking at a shape project um, because although you see the contours of something, it is very difficult to read it. There's not enough, literally, there's not enough information. Information is being withheld from you. And yet it has this kind of incredibly spooky affect of, of involutions and mass that also at the same time seem to be stretched screens and um, where a hint of very lightweight construction is confounded by the fact that you seem to be looking um, at a piece of rock. Um, and so this kind of double doubling or um, illegibility, um, the, the lack of anything except an outline or what some, somebody like Graham Harmon might call the general outline is what pushes this project into the realm of shape. So elusive, illegible, at least linguistically, difficult to cognize, hard to hold in one's mind, oscillating at the threshold between shape and form, um, that is eluding known meanings and associations. And there are a couple subcategories of this that I'm seeing kind of with um, very encouraging regularity in the work of a few practices. Um, the first is related to Michael Fried's uh, um, definition of theatricality, which of course is another very famous uh, mediation on shape. And I apologize for the long quotes, I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but you guys will, will likely know this. It's, a, it's the most famous quote from the only famous piece that Michael Fried ever produced, which is um, Art and Objecthood. And he's got this creepy line in here where he talks about objects that have uh, um, a, a quality, a theatrical presence or a subject-like presence that produces the affect of being distanced or crowded by the silent presence of another person. And he says, this is my favorite part of this quote, the experience of coming upon, he calls them literalist objects, the experience of coming upon literalist objects unexpectedly for example, in somewhat darkened rooms, can be literally, uh, sorry, can be strongly, if momentarily disquieting in just this way. Like when you walk into a room and you feel like there's another presence already there. 
um, and uh, uh, this is going to lead him uh, down this path. He, he writes a piece called um, Shape as Form, where he talks about a vibration that happens between what you think you're seeing graphically and what you understand that you're seeing um, in terms of a mass or in terms of a ground. Um, and of course, his examples are Frank Stella's canvases uh, from the 1960s. Um, you're seeing the same kind of effect happening here in this particularly creepy project by Tom Wiscombe Architecture. Um, this is the Shenzhen Museum of Science um, in 2019, where what you see are forms that have a shape-like quality to them. Um, they've got a very strong silhouette, for example. Um, they've got these involutions and, and, and steps and incursions into the form. But just as is the case with the Frank Stella, the difference between the literal supports and the depicted uh, shape, literal shape and the depicted shape, to use uh, free uh, terms, you have to look at it both graphically and massively at the same time. And that produces the same kind of tension or vibration or oscillation between being able to read something graphically and, being, and having to sense it as a presence in the room. And here you can see one of uh, Tom's uh, sort of signature drawings, um, uh, what he calls uh, Godzilla drawings um, in, in reference to way kaiju illustrations are usually uh, done, where the features of the project are pulled out and left uh, to stand on their own, um, giving you again a chance to kind of try to read something that resists legibility. Um, and of course, here is uh, uh, the, the example that uh, Michael Fried was referring to uh, when he was talking about theatricality as a quality in minimalist art, Robert Morris Beams. Um, and when I see this work now, it reminds me um, actually of somebody who taught for a number of years at the Angavante, um, uh, Christy Vallier, uh, who like Tom is one of my colleagues at SciArc. And I promise you not everything I'm gonna show is from SciArc. Um, but, but where basically you have something that is, is refusing to be quiet as a graphic. So the, the, the name of this project, all of their project titles are very clever. Um, the name of this project is uh, Loud Lines. It was their fin uh, finals proposal for the PS1, uh, MoMA Young Architects Competition last year. Um, and as you can see, the graphic qualities here are being immediately confounded and challenged by the corrugated pipe volume of the pieces themselves. And the way that they occupy the space of the courtyard or the way they would have with kind of peeking over and kind of, and, and having a stance sort of crouching down into that courtyard space um, is very reminiscent actually of what uh, Michael Fried was discussing in Art and Objecthood where you feel crowded by the insistent presence of something that still withdraws from the ability to cognize it or to turn it into known meaning. It's funny to me actually that when Christy thinks about this project, she talks about this project, she spends a lot of time talking about joints. Um, I think the joints create the posture, um, but the, the, the affect of the posture is actually in the conversion of lines into volumes. It has very little to do with the kind of the technical aspects of how this thing is put together. And I would say that that's an important thing for architects today to keep in mind, that the technical apparatus that allows things to come into being is uh, insignificant in the end uh, compared to their long life as things that we find difficult to grasp or comprehend. Um, another thing that falls under the rubric of shape for me is actually a kind of a Viennese idea. Um, uh, one of the projects that I associate this with is an old project by Adolf Loos, um, the Tristan Ara house, um, whereby a house is given, a facade is given a face, a literal kind of almost human kind of grimace or smile here, appropriate for doing a project for a Dadaist artist, I suppose. It's also picked up by uh, John Hadick, um, showing you here in his uh, um, 
very shapey portrait of John Haydick that I love. Um, uh, in uh, um, uh, the, the Kreuzberg uh, Tower project, where again, a face appears on the side of the building. And what this does is it makes you look again. You know you're not looking at a face, but the human cognition can't help but kind of do that thing that Rudolf Arnheim was also talking about, something that approaches as a friend or an enemy, something that before you know what hits you, you are already being hit. And again, we see this coming back uh, into the world of architecture. So this is a project by a really un, uh, a super talented young architect based in Boston. His name is William O'Brien Jr. He is, his firm was called W-O-J-R, uh, which I always pronounce in my own mind as Woodrow. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Brian Jr. Um, has been playing with this kind of shape, I think in a particularly fresh way, where you see kind of face or profile emerging in very simple configurations on the outside of buildings that otherwise remain difficult to read. And again, going back to the Shenzhen Museum of Science by Tom Wiscombe, um, here, when he talks about the, the, the shapes that are being produced here, he expresses those as a kind of what he calls a near faciality, um, uh, where he's talking about winks and smiles and lip liner an eyeliner and even some kind of uh, mascara-like effects whereby certain near facial features like grins um, and winks are being emphasized in totemic forms. So here's the smile. Um, and then of course all of these things are bound up in this larger discussion of silhouette. Silhouette is a way I think that, that architects are trying to grapple with how one withholds legibility while producing memorable form. So withholding legibility, legibility is the easy way to produce form that sits in one's mind, but it sits in one's mind in the kind of the symbolic. Um, it sits in one's mind in a way that makes its meaning immediately clear. And as soon as meaning is immediately clear, it can be read and forgotten. Um, so, so uh, projects that live very comfortably on Instagram in terms of, uh, of being legible, known, or comfortable forms, um, they have an instant legibility that means that they're in fact not memorable. Whereas projects that draw you in and ask you to return again and again and again to them um, often will have a kind of strong outline. This is another William O'Brien uh, Jr. project that I quite like. It's from his piece called, his, uh, it's like a collection of small houses called The Orchard. And many of these forms have these uh, uh, very strong kind of Hayduckian overtones of, of sort of ridges and of oversized shingles begin kind of stick in one's mind, again, like, a, like being crowded by other people like seeing that you're not the only person in the room or in the space. Um, and same architect, this is the Horn House. And here, what strikes you immediately is the outline. What strikes you immediately is the shape that's being made against um, the sky or here. Um, and then I would say a kind of a very, <clears throat> easily recognized, um, at least architecturally, if not cognitively, subset of this kind of silhouette work is something that we first saw um, back in the, uh, the amazing of, um, of James Sterling. So I'm showing you here his uh, Leicester Engineering Building um, with these kind of sawtooth ridges um, uh, sort of being blown up um, and, and, and three-dimensionally puffed out to produce very, very strong, recognizable silhouette. Um, and we see the same thing in O'Brien Jr.'s work here playing with the sawtooth uh, form, it's a pretty elegant little detail uh, here in the roof, I would say. Um, and then also again, Tom Wiscombe's work, this is the OBM headquarters in Columbus, Ohio, where the sawtooth uh, motif is combined with maze-like features, and labyrinth-like features to again produce a recognizable outline, a recognizable silhouette, 
produces these kind of spooky, almost monster-like or teeth-like shadows. Then finally, on this category of shape, there is something, it's funny, I got this, uh, this concept from Jeff Kipnis, who in between terror, bouts of pure terror managed to teach me uh, most, most of what I know about architecture. Um, and he was talking about, there's two buildings by a kind of a, a very good a service firm in Boston um, on the Harvard campus that are near twins of each other. And he was mentioning how they would always remind him of the creepy twins in the movie, The Shining. Um, um, and how just by the presence of being doubled, certain shapes that might not have enough memorability in and of themselves become memorable, significant, and creepy. Um, so uh, one project that does this quite well, I would say, is again, another project by Tom Wiscombe Architecture, whereby a series of shapes are repeated in silhouette. This is the Vilnius Concert Hall uh, in Vilnius, Lithuania, um, a 2019 as well. Um, and just copying of the forms across the silhouette um, uh, creates, um, again, a kind of shape is form moment where what you're looking at is both to be understood graphically as well as massively. Um, and the juxtaposition of the two makes the form something that you think you might know, but that you cannot understand. Another Godzilla of that project. Um, and then William O'Brien Jr. has been playing with this as well. So this is uh, um, from his um, uh, orchard uh, house where he's literally taking something and mirroring it, but only near mirroring it and then replicating the forms. You can see even in the way that the, the, the graphics of the project or the drawings of the project are produced, the effect of twinning or the effect of copying is an intentional um, aspect of the work. This is another project by um, O'Brien Jr., um, which is called The Hall House, where the work is presented and understood as a kind of ink blot of itself or Rorschach of itself, um, whereby you have to look at something as only half of another twin, even when that twin is merely implied rather than expressed. And here's another uh, Christy Vallier a project shown in um, an alarming series of GIFs. <laughs> um, um, this is a uh, Bear Ballier's um, uh, No Middle Rise, which is a project that they designed for Chicago, um, wherein these two forms, one upside down, one right side up, talk to each other and create a dialogue with each other and outline with each other. Um, as opposed to registering anything around them. And that's, I think, another one of these large features of shape. Shape is not concerned with referencing adjacent form. It is concerned with making its own ground. In other words, it's reaching back into the disciplinary ground of architecture uh, and not into the surrounding context of its time. Um, oh, I forgot this one. So final shape subcategory, I would call it the other shape. And this is something that I'm really interested in. I've been kind of following it and thinking about it for a couple of years now. We might say it could be class as obscurity. Um, the other shape is a very old idea. It comes from actually um, a passage of Milton where he, he writes, he's talking about um, the shape of death um, appearing at the mouth of hell. It's from Paradise Lost, very um, disturbing um, poem. Um, and he says, the other shape, if shape it might be called, that shape had none. Distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance might be called that shadow seemed. It's a very weird passage um, in English literature, and it's one that would resonate all around um, um, aesthetics for actually for uh, centuries. And for instance, it becomes one of the chief instances of the kind of sublimity that uh, Edmund Burke describes under the subcategory obscurity, uh, where you look at something, and he, as he puts it, he's referencing a biblical passage, where you look at something and the hair on your forearm or the back of your neck stands up because you know something's there, but you can't quite tell what it is. 
Um, so actually, this is a project uh, by Farshid uh, Musabi um, that it's, it's a fairly old project, um, uh, but I think it expresses a little bit of what I'm talking about here. This is 130 Finchurch Street of London, which was finished in 2019, although it was designed earlier, um, in which what we might be familiar with as a kind of uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe Friedrichstrasse model is being uh, turned into a glimmering, scalloped, opaque monolith um, using black fritted glass. Um, and the effect is quite eerie, almost as if somebody took a particular outline, going back to the idea of a general outline, a particular outline um, and, and cut it out of the city um, rather than adding it to it. Um, and again, blackness is, is one, is, is a kind of something that we'll see running through um, uh, today's examples. Blackness relating back to what um, uh, Baram Shardell and Andrew Zago and Jeff Kipnis were all discussing in the 1990s when they talked about black stuff. Um, another example of this, going back to Brian Jr., is his um, not subtle homage to John Haydick, who might be considered kind of one of the godfathers of the shape um, project um, as I'm just, as I'm uh, defining it today. Um, with his, this is his mask house. And so you can see it kind of looks a little bit like John Haydick's wall house. It's got the same shape, but then it's also got the particular features of some of John Haydick's masks. Um, so here's his wall house where you look at something and because of the way that it's being screened or what is being put in front of your face, you have to kind of glimpse the form behind. So it's almost like the form is coming at you. If you think about this as, as, as being a durational experience, uh, um, which of course in real life it is, instead of seeing it in a picture, rather than just an imagistic experience, you're left with the sense that something is coming at you, but you don't quite know what before it hits you, you know you are being hit. Um, I think also in this same uh, general oeuvre, we could place this project. Um, this is uh, Soel's um, uh, K11 uh, Art and Culture Center in Hong Kong, which was finished in 2017, where a kind of um, oversized uh, um, uh, uh, part uh, pipe in glass is used as a facade mechanism here. It's a, it's a quite um, beautiful facade mechanism that keeps you also guessing about what might be beyond um, and throws you back confused glance, uh, glances um, of what you might otherwise not see in the context around you. And this is another project by So Il, um, which many of you will know, it received a lot of press, the Kuchi Gallery in Seoul, uh, South Korea, where again, you know, they call this um, a, the chain mail veil. Um, I might have named it differently, but the chain mail veil of this project wrapped around some basic forms prevents you from immediately recognizing um, the simplicity of the architecture behind it and gives it an aura of almost unbelievability or a kind of ghostly uh, quality of walking up to something and, and sort of not, not being familiar with this as the outside envelope of a building. Um, of course, the idea of producing a project like this is all about kind of obscuring where the inside is or what is happening on the inside. So again, this is the Shenzhen Science Museum by Tom Wickham. Um, where those involutions are almost like blind eyes staring back at you um, or otherwise undefinable sphinx-like features um, uh, that don't tell you what is inside of the project, but instead throw you back on yourself, um, just like Michael Fried was discussing with theatrical art in the 60s. This is a project that I think also, I, I mentioned it here because I like it for uh, several reasons. Um, it also has a very beautiful veil on one facade. Um, this is a project by uh, Nader Tarani. Um, uh, it says Melbourne College of Art and Design. Um, and the, the curtain here 
coupled with the patterns that are produced with the shadowing of the trees, um, again presents a kind of distancing um, of the presence of the building. Um, all right, so home stretch. Shape is one way of producing a kind of vibrating relationship or an oscillating relationship between something that is coming at you that is hard to cognize and something that you feel might be familiar or that you recognize might be memorable because of its strong silhouette or intriguing outline. Um, then an analogous or allied term is what I would call liveliness. And I'm using liveliness here as a kind of pushback against what I would, what I would call a kind of still life impulse in architecture that exists in our contemporary moment, at least in the United States, where I notice people producing um, uh, interiors in, in specific that are collections of objects that do not seem to move um, and are presented as if they were in a gallery. So in contrast to that, Liveliness would be collections of whole objects, each vying in some unquiet way for autonomy within a particular project, often appearing too big for their casings um, or as if they were separately packaged within uh, the projects they find themselves in. So a kind of unquietness or a lack of resolution or a group or a collection of individual bodies that are kind of tensely held together rather than a unified whole or a still composition as you might see in a still life. And of course here again, the granddaddy of this project is probably, uh, at least in recent times, is probably John Haydick with these uh, unquiet pieces here in his cathedral project that seem to have the ability to cruise around the container um, in which they find themselves um, as if it were a mere boundary they may choose or may not choose to respect. Another example of the project I was already discussing as well, the Buster Engineering Building by James Sterling, in which masses reveal themselves to have their own independence. They are not resolved into a unified composition. Another example on an interior might be Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Hollyhock House, where the fireplace literally feels cut out and separate from the rest of the project and act is actually presented with a moat around it, as if it were its own piece, again, as if it had its own presence, again, as if it were something like a subject of another entity that deserved your attention, but which you did not know, and you discovered it in a darkened room. So a project that builds directly on this uh, legacy is another project by Tom Wiscombe Architecture. Um, this is actually a project that's nearing completion. Um, it's in Utah, it's called the Dark Chalet. And inside of this kind of enigmatic, uh, again, uh, dark shapely silhouette um, is this large nested object, in this case, a kind of fireplace stair object, which kind of glowers from within this volume um, and uh, is barely contained uh, by that volume. Um, and it provides the core of the house around which everything else is organized. Another example that is perhaps a bit more playful and a little less dark would be the interior of the Vilnius Concert Hall um, in Lithuania, in which a bunch of kind of very individual objects are bounded together, but in no way tamed by the vitrine-like container in which they find themselves. So here's an inferior view with kind of this, this great object stair <clears throat> um, pushing down into the project. Um, and then uh, here are these two nested uh, concert hall spaces kind of being given their own envelopes within the larger enclosure. The project that does this very beautifully is uh, Nadir Tarani's um, Hinman Research building. This is the, the project that he did at Georgia Tech, which as you can see here, even in his diagrams of the project is presented as a series of individual objects held together within a large hangar-like space. And I think the thing that gives us away as a lively project is actually the little wooden platform upon which this kind of 
hanging sock um, of mesh in which the stair, the spiral stair is barely contained. Uh, uh, that the sock comes down on its own little plinth, its own little platform, as if it were its own entity, as if it were something like a statue or a figure, uh, even a human figure uh, in its own right. Here's another view of that. Uh, Trani has actually made a bit of a specialty um, of this kind of large figure in a, um, an enclosure that actually seems a little bit constrained by or pinched by that figure. Um, for example, here, this is the project in Melbourne again. This is the Melbourne um, uh, Design School of Design um, in Australia. And there's this very telling moment here in this building where this big plywood thingy, um, um, which has a, a kind of great deal of um, a theatricality to it, has a great deal of posture to it, almost like a contrapposto posture uh, to it, uh, comes down and seems to kind of pinch the, the, the um, nominal enclosure of the surrounding floors. And the other moment is what happens uh, in the background of this particular photograph, which is my favorite photograph for the project, because you realize that that stair object seems to be much too big um, for the space in which it finds itself. Um, and it's actually pulled out by uh, Nadir Tarani in his, when he talks about uh, the project and he writes about the project, he pull again as Tom does too, pulls out the stair object as this own entity that has its own presence within the space, its own lively presence. O'Brien Jr. has taken this in a slightly different direction, but I think it's a beautiful one, um, whereby pieces of the interior in particular separate themselves out um, and become uh, uncanny um, and lifelike, in this case, almost seeming to be sort of pregnant or breathing uh, presences uh, within the space. Um, this is his um, horn house uh, project, um, which is uh, built and truly uh, lovely. Um, where, there, where one senses that this is no longer, of course, there are Nisian overtones here, but this is no longer the kind of quiet array of beautiful surfaces and planes sliding past each other that we're familiar with from the high modernist project, but instead uh, um, kind of lifelike or, or lively uh, um, elements that refuse to integrate smoothly into the larger context and yet still maintain a kind of tense and active relationship within a particular space. Um, and then again, this is developed in a different direction by Tom Wiscom going back to the OBM headquarters project in Columbus, Ohio, in the interior of that project, where a number of, where the floors are treated like boxes, they're treated like trays in which a number of individual pro uh, programs are nestled almost the way that you would nestle um, those kind of paper cups that hold biscuits within a biscuit tin, um, each having their own kind of separate sense, sensibility and their own identity. And then the last a bit of, a, of a, a direction that I think we could move toward to keep doing architecture, um, an architecture we could move toward would have to do with the ground. And I'm provisionally calling this indifference, but indifference is not still quite right. I'm still thinking about it. Um, what I will say is that this is building on um, the very brilliant analysis of different relationships to the ground uh, that Jeff Kipnis did, where he moved from uh, a kind of arising or growing from the ground, as you see in the Roby House by Frank Lloyd Wright, um, to a kind of stage set off from the ground um, as you see in these van der Rohe's of Farnsworth House, and then up to um, a kind of um, a house in the air, to use Le Cabizier's expression as it relates to the Villa Savoie. Um, and here is a Kipnis's diagram stolen from a YouTube video. Um, then, you know, Jeff also attempted to kind of keep working on this, so he talked about the kind of the folded plane project as being a bringing of the ground into the building. Um, I think that is not a good idea. Um, it was a, an impoverished project, I think, built on a misunderstanding of philosophy. 
um, which can often be super productive in architecture. I have no problem with misunderstanding architecture, uh, misunderstanding philosophy. But in this case, um, I think the idea that somehow the ground could be folded and incorporated into architecture was maybe a misunderstanding of architecture's role in the city. That actually architecture's role in the city is not to let the city be the author of architecture at all, um, but to stand against the city in which one is situated uh, by reaching uh, toward things that are unknown or back towards things that are forgotten. The project that may have come closest to a kind of indifference to the ground um, in, uh, in previous uh, generations is Peter Eisenman's Max Reinhardt House, which is described by him as having an indifferent relationship to the ground plane. So as if it could kind of sit anywhere. It's part of it could be buried, part of it could be above, part of it could be um, uh, far above. Uh, but in any case, it is its own Mobius-like entity. It is enclosed within itself. And here, again, just referring to the same practices that I've been going to for this particular lecture, um, an indifference to the ground might manifest in seeing very, very lightly, like a tray or a platter or a saucer on the ground, um, as we see here in this, um, this, uh, uh, this is the Twin House uh, project, again, by William O'Brien Jr. Um, here, I showed you this in terms of its silhouette um, before, but actually what I, this is the uh, Hindi Borg House. Uh, but what I didn't show you or didn't point out is the strange way in which this project meets or doesn't meet the ground. You can see it a bit more clearly here in section. Again, as though a plate were placed on a table. A plate could be placed on anything and it just so happens to be placed on the ground. Um, or again, this happens in the Shenzhen Museum of Science where the project lifts up at the corners and denies the expected relationship or the expected connection to the ground on which it happens to be placed. Um, and then finally, going back to the OBM headquarters again by Tom, um, uh, this, I think, is a really lovely uh, update to the Indifference project that I've just been covering, mm -hmm. the Indifference to the Ground Plane project, um, where something seems to come in and click into place, almost like, and these are Tom's word here, um, as when one spacecraft docks with another. Um, something having to do with a temporary or precarious connection to what we know is something worthwhile to pursue, I would say, in architecture. Again, because it challenges our assumptions of what time we're in and what we might be expecting. It is not about comfort. It is not about the known. It is not about tying in with a particular context, but about connecting to it in a challenging way toward an architecture, indeed. Thank you very much for your attention. That was, I see, a full hour lecture. Excuse me for going long. Um, and I would be very happy to answer any questions or have a discussion if you would like. Great, thank you, Marika, very much. I was like, <laughs> I, I made tons of notes. Um, Maybe just so that every everyone can digest a little bit and uh, uh, come to a question. When you were progressing through the through the through the through your presentation, I was you know I was just kind of like uh, writing down also associations and maybe uh, I have a question towards. Kind of the sublime project you know which has been which which actually um has been uh it seems like it's i don't know if i if i understood you partly partly right it seems it's kind of embedded in your in part in part of your interests uh so kind of it's a it's a certain um Reemergence of it in a in a certain way. I was just wondering if it's uh, if you if you have the feeling that the sublime that has been discussed, not necessarily by Burke, but by but by but by architects in the you know like in the early two thousands, I would say, right? If 
how your interest would relate to that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm really glad that you asked it. I have a I have a hesitant relationship with the sublime, probably mm -hmm. because it was discussed in the mm -hmm. early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I what I don't like about the sublime is that it smacks of transcendence to me. Mm -hmm. It smacks of trying to uh, pull oneself out um, of one's body, of one's embodied experience. Um, you know, usually the way we would, we would couch the sublime in contemporary terms is it's a, it's a, it's an ego overwhelming event, mm -hmm. um, or it's a psychosomatic experience that takes one out of oneself, literally. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of sublime, I think is an outdated part mm -hmm. of the humanist project. I think we are firmly in a post-humanist moment. And what I mean by that is now is the time to practice embodied humility. Mm -hmm. When I say humility, I, I'm referring to uh, Timothy Morton's very lovely um, exegesis on that term, where he goes back and looks at the root of uh, humility and describes it as a groundedness or uh, uh, being kind of forced to ground. And that's kind of the opposite of the sublime, being forced to ground. The part of the sublime though that I am still secretly interested in, and you picked up on it, is the idea of obscurity. Mm -hmm. So something that you can't easily see, mm -hmm. um, that you, or if you see it, you can't easily cognize it. So in other words, something that stays in the realm of shape, Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I appreciate that part of Burke. Like if you go back and you read his little bit on obscurity, it's actually um, not um, uh, coincidentally, I would say, the part mm -hmm. where he gets most enthusiastic about architecture, which in general for him is a lesser form of the sublime. Mm -hmm. Sublime was originally a rhetorical concept coming from Longinus um, and uh, attempts to produce um, a kind of amazing sense of uplift and unity within um, a group of listeners to, you know, really eloquent orator. And, you know, every time we talk about the sublime in that way, of course, everyone uh, who is an educated person immediately goes to the Third Reich. So we kind of, you know, we have a kind of natural disinclination to head towards that kind of euphoria. But any experience that attempts to overwhelm the ego um, is it, it, rather than kind of presenting an embodied sense of one's smallness in the world, I think is a is a fault is a red herring or a, a false direction for architecture. That was a very roundabout way of answering your question. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's a there's a line between there's a line between form forms that live in the realm of shape to use free terminology. So they, they stay back um, and forms that, um, um, that attempt to express a kind of transcendent grandeur. So the first, I think we need now more than ever in our, in our era today of um, instantly visually and cognitively accessible material. Mm -hmm. Um, because it forces us into a more uncertain and questioning and critical relationship with the world in which we find ourselves. The second, I think, is a dead project. Mm -hmm. And when you say visual, do you think that that's also kind of like, uh, you did say visual, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that, you think that's also kind of like uh, a consequence of our, I mean, it becomes more and more saturated. It's not that it hasn't been going on for a really long time, but uh, uh, kind of like visually um, oversaturated by media and all of those things, environment. Is that yeah, something that we have been trained, you know, that, 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 yeah, we have been trained into by, you know, by all cultural developments to, to into this extreme visual, post-human subject? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the po post-human subjectivity is the subjectivity of our time. Mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, what I would hope for would be um, an expansion of, of the grounds of um, embodied experience and cognition 
mm -hmm. uh, with uh, coupled with a deep and hu humble sense of not knowing, as opposed to a post post humanism in the ironic sense of the term, which is how it's often deployed. Post humanism meaning like anything goes. Let's just surf for images. Let's do mm -hmm. search instead of research. Let's present quick quick stuff that looks good on Instagram, grab people's attention, that kind of thing. That I find is, is um, a cynical st a stance. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think that architecture can live in the realm of cynicism. Um, it's my problem with, it's what I was saying at the beginning of the lecture when I had like my long preamble about why I used the, the title that I did. Mm -hmm. um, wake up call to people that wanna do architecture. Architecture is not a destructive act. Mm -hmm. It's a constructive act. It's a creative act. It requires bringing something into the world rather than dismantling something, no matter how problematic that already exists in the world. And so the kind of posthumanism that, say, somebody like Reza Negrostani is talking about when he writes about inhumanism, mm -hmm. um, which would be, again, a kind of humbled and uncertain stance in uh, a universe that we know that we don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. is what I would advocate always because it involves wonder and questioning and curiosity and creativity over and above any kind of cynicism or slickness, mm -hmm. which I find really disturbing. Mm -hmm. So just out to the audience, please feel free to join in. Also, of course, if you feel like uh, writing up a question into the chat, uh, you are, everybody's welcome, of course, to do so. There's been, there's been a, a, just a, a comment about um, you having a, interesting point on legibility and critical practice in general. So I guess uh, uh, if, if you haven't read that, just a, a, a compliment, I guess. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you, James. I, um, I you know, I think it, it's so strange to say after all the places I've been and all the positions that I've advocated for in my short career so far, short and undistinguished career in architectural history and theory, um, it's funny to say that even today in 2020, that I believe in the form of the critical project, but I, I suppose I realize that I do. Mm -hmm. I do believe in a form of the critical project because I think ever since, as I said in my opening remarks, um, certainly ever since the, the limitations of the enlightenment became clear, I think it really became ethically incumbent on architecture to challenge the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there, there is a move right now, at least in the United States, towards an aesthetics of banality, towards an aesthetics of comfort, towards an aesthetics of the known, the everyday, the vernacular. Um, and uh, I think it's a false move. I think mm -hmm. those of us who have historical knowledge of what happened in, say, the decade of the 1970s um, recognize already that although it appears to be an act of service to move toward that and away from a critical project, it ends up simply being a facile band-aid on a deep wound. Yeah, I, I saw a hand from Constantine Kim. You can just go ahead and ask the question. Constantine, go ahead. Turn, you have to turn on your, your uh, microphone. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you for the lecture. Um, I might ask a bit of a provocative question. As you know, Sanford was our professor at Angivante for quite some time. So um, just uh, when I was listening to your presenta long pre uh, presentation about the shape, I couldn't escape the, the phrase the autopoiesis of architecture in the back of my head. And I, ho I, ho I hope you're not offended by it. Um, so I would like to maybe ask a bit more about um, in that realm of perception of architecture, um, at which point 
it's not it's it's um, it's not hermetic. At which point that process of um, conceiving architecture, maybe even viscerally uh, as much as visually, um, it becomes more than just that. At which point this uh, um, how, how we can um, some project provoke uh, something? Uh, how how the shape and the form are interacting a different processes of semiosis of of uh, maybe interactions how how that perception is not hermetically between a consumer and an architecture uh, but rather maybe outside of that thank you I, yeah that's a really good question thank you for asking it um, so my so there I feel like there are two influences maybe that are converging a little bit in the question. The one would be the kind of Patrick Schumacher project that he calls the autopoiesis of architecture, um, which has developed in a in a very different direction than I imagine uh, Sanford could support, um, because it has to do with a line of thought in which um, the appeal to nature fallacy um, is used constantly as a means by which formal maneuvers are being justified, as if there was something inherently natural about a triangulated mesh, mesh work or a kind of uh, computer-driven calculus. So that, so I want to set that up aside um, because I think that's maybe the straw man here. Um, I, I, I would find it, any argument that is built on a sense of inevitability um, as if all humans had to do uh, in order to live ethically in the world was to align themselves with nature red and tooth and claw, to use the old expression, is in my opinion a misunderstanding um, of nature and a misunderstanding of what it means to be human. So uh, um, it, that's a dark road to go down. And again, I always kind of hear Hitler in the back of my, the back of my head when people start describing um, natural processes as being those toward which we should inevitably tend. So that's the kind of my oblique, uh, our oblique critique of uh, Schumacher. But then on the other hand, I think what Sanford is, is talking about is a very different kind of autopoiesis. Uh, in which it's not about generating form um, or justifying form via natural processes or, you know, the movements of slime molds or things like that, or the kind of the, the root structures or rhizomes or any of that stuff, but it's about recognizing that the world is full of vibrating and, and forever altering and constantly individuating and abundant forms of life and liveliness. And actually that goes back to what I was saying about having a kind of wondering, questioning and humble relationship to the world, whereby the best thing you could possibly do, and this maybe goes back to Maya's question a little bit as well, the best thing that you could possibly do in the world is not to get out of your own head in a kind of transcendent way, but get out of your own head in an imminent way, whereby, you know, Sanford calls this flying the bullet, I believe, whereby you're able to actually loom out over your status as a subject and recognize even for glimpses or flashes or brief moments that there are other entities standing in the room with you. So it's an abundant uh, and a, a kind of, uh, um, to use Simondon's uh, term, individuating uh, uh, a quality to the world that ought to invoke a sense of humility and wonder rather than a sense of certainty. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, <laughs> Sanford, Sanford, by the way, Sanford and I have a long going, uh, you know, Sanford was my uh, mentor um, when I was at the GSD a number of years ago. Um, and he and I have a kind of long running debate about 
um, exactly what you've been, you, you've just outlined. Um, I, I feel like you can't forever hold off um, aligning yourself with particular formal projects. Um, and I, I am constantly sort of getting on Sanford's case about not committing himself to various moves in the world. Because as I said in the beginning of my talk, I personally, you know, maybe this is because my background is in architecture and his is in literature. Uh, may, may be as simple as that, but I personally don't think you can have a project without form. Um, so that means that it's all so much hot air unless you can figure out a way to connect it with what we can actually do in the world. Um, just as a, sorry, as a sm small res fast response, um, I, I, I agree with you that, about the form. However, I think that um, from Sanford's position, it, it would be, if I can accept, like somehow imagine this position, uh, the talk will, would be about um, how form orchestrates or how form, how we sense form, how form senses us, um, and how is that, that, how is that affecting the relationships that we establish in, in the form or around the form. And, and, and it's not so much about the form, however, form is a medium, but rather about the effect of the form or the energy yeah. that the form pr produces in the space. But yeah. Yes, there we have no disagreement. That's the part of Sanford's thinking that I find as fresh as it ever was. I have no disagreement there. Thank you. Yeah, can I ask a question related to the art theory or the history, the historical like um, outline of the of the post minimalism. So, um, so it's interesting that you showed Frank Stella as well as um, Tom Wiscombe's project. Um, like for Frank Stella, as you also mentioned that, um, like Michael Free was the one who's somehow framing his work as a minimalism, and that somehow transit um, transgress to the architectural discussion, like uh, what Rosalind Krauss talked about miss um, the experience in miss building about the theatricality so i think for for the projects you show tonight would you say these are a new kind of interpretation of the post uh, minimalism or and how you think about the uh, theatricality is being um, transformed under this specific um, historical context like whether we can understand the new uh, theatricality as as the indifference or estrangement in within this specific uh, architectural context well my my instinct is that the answer is yes but it's only an instinct because I feel like I I haven't thought it all the way through yet so um, I would say uh, with Sanford, by the way, that Michael Fried's greatest gift to the world was the one he never intended to give, which is um, a, a full-throated explanation of why theatricality works um, and uh, why enframement is, um, is forever tied to an outdated humanist project. Um, and so I think one thing that good projects do, and actually you, what I like about the concept of theatricality is you can run it backwards as well as forwards. That to me is a sign that you're actually doing something disciplinary, by the way, um, is when you can run something back and find a history for it or find a genealogy for it as well as find a future for it. Uh, what I like about theatricality is that you can do that. You can go back and you can reinterpret the Bavarian Rococo, for example, as Karsten Harris has done um, as a theatrical project. You can go back uh, to even a project that stayed as uh, um, Alberti's project in the Renaissance um, and start looking at the, uh, the theatrical kind of uh, a paper, paper arrangements on the facades of his buildings. Um, so you can make it work. But then if you think about how current theatricality would differ from those projects, I would say it's precisely in their degree of legibility. So I think the future of theatrical architecture is going to be um, uh, less static than minimalist work could have been, um, more lively, as I was suggesting, and also um, 
uh, less reassuring. And uh, that doesn't mean that we should all be producing uh, giant versions of John Haydick's um, suicide and mother of a suicide, um, as I sometimes think William O'Brien is just waiting for an opportunity to do that. Um, uh, but it does mean that we should be producing things that have a difficult relationship to their context and a difficult relationship to human subjectivity. For instance, one thing that I know Tom has been playing around with a lot, Tom Wiskin has been playing around with a lot, is um, the way scale is, uh, is subverted or is reinterpreted um, so that you feel like you might be looking at something that was intended to be very, very small or even something that was intended to be very, very large, so that when it appears in the world, it seems strangely low res, for example. Um, moves like that or feints like that are a way of presenting theatricality um, as not centered around the human audience alone. So they're a way of letting objects have a kind of objecthood, to go back and use Freed's uh, terminology, um, that goes beyond what we know and what we are used to caring about. So that perhaps we might be able to engage in the world in more surprising um, and less routine ways. Thank you for the answer. Very refreshing points. Awesome. I, by the way, guys, these are really good questions, I, and I really appreciate them. Thank you. So anybody else? Yeah, it's our evening after all, I guess. Uh, it, it, it's time it's time for um it's time for some wine yeah in Vietnam. yes it is it <laughs> is it is i think we have to start to you know do the do the virtual wine drinking at least yeah. you know to have a, so. because mm -hmm. that's for, that's for sure i think uh missing if uh, one cannot be Yes, I miss, Together. guys, one thing that I miss about the coronavirus, which is a completely human comfort um, thing to miss and goes against everything that I've just proclaimed myself in favor of, <laughs> is finger food. Yes. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you guys again for having me um, lecturing at the Angamante. It really uh, is such a privilege and an honor to be uh, talking to you guys. And I also appreciated the, the depth and um, insight of your questions afterwards. So thank you for sticking with a very long slideshow. Totally great. Thank you very much for, for joining. We are uh, mo most more than thrilled. You called, me, you called me an optimist before, but I think that your lecture was kind of uh, also a very optimistic point of view that architecture has something to go towards too. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I really hope that we can get you into our Zooms soon again, also into studios and uh, yeah, to kind of keep that exchange going. That would be lovely. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you, you very Marika. much. Thank you everybody for joining and uh, in, see you back in two weeks.